Hello, my name is Andy Sterling. I'm a trainer with the North Carolina Department of Labor. I work for OSHA here in North Carolina. Uh, this is part of a series that we're doing uh, specifically that deals with the COVID-19 outbreak. And so I'm doing a few different webinars. One is respiratory protection, which we're going to talk about today. The other two uh, involve PPE in both general industry and in construction. So I'd like to welcome everybody today. Uh, this is a virtual format, so you're going to see a slideshow. Uh, unfortunately today, because this is a recording, you won't be able to send in chat messages, so I won't be able to talk to you uh, directly and answer questions. However, if you do have a question, you are more than welcome to contact us at North Carolina Department of Labor we'll answer any questions. You can ask for me or you can ask for any of the folks that work there including the folks that are in standards and we'll get you to the right place to get your question answered. Okay so today we're going to talk about respiratory protection. We're going to go through a PowerPoint slideshow at the beginning and then once we get down towards the end we are actually going to have a video portion of this which is something kind of new uh, where I am going to demonstrate how to don and how to doff some of this different PPE. A lot of you, this is your first opportunity working with PPE. This really isn't something part of your everyday uh, normal routine. Uh, some of you folks have a lot of questions. Uh, there's a lot of industries where PPE and respiratory protection are just an everyday thing. Uh, there are a lot of folks nowadays, especially in things like warehousing uh, and grocery and deliveries and so on that actually are doing this for the first time where we have never been in a situation where we actually did have to have uh, face masks or any sort of respiratory protection. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through. First thing is a little bit of housekeeping and I just wanted to let you know that this standard applies to the industries that you see here. Typically things like shipyards and marine terminals and longshoring you know, we teach those as part of our marine course uh, and our jurisdiction is of course the feds have uh, jurisdiction over navigable waters so it's really not something we talk a lot about. However, something like respiratory protection, this is kind of universal and it covers everybody. So this is something that actually uh, when we have folks that are adhering to those standards, they are also bound to the respiratory protection standard as well. The standard itself, 1910-134, is organized as you see here. There's a number of different sections that uh, you can go through and using your appendices uh, or your table of contents in the front, you can find exactly what uh, applies to your situation. Uh, things like selection of respirators, maintaining your program, how to use a respirator, uh, breathing air and use of breathing air as well as the appendices, which I always recommend folks go and look at those uh, you know, really first off because they're going to tell you a lot of the things that you need to know from the very, very get-go. Okay, so meaning, uh, you know, how do I choose a respirator? How do I make sure, you know, I'm doing everything properly? So how am I doing my fit testing? Are the procedures correct? Are my seal checks correct? Am I cleaning this correctly? Do I have the right medical questionnaire? It's all right there for you in the appendices, so I always recommend everybody check that out. In this course, we're going to be talking a little bit about having a written respiratory protection program. A lot of people think this is a pretty daunting task. Uh, I will say it can be. However, there are a lot of very economical programs out there that are nothing more than just boilerplate that you simply fill out yourself. Uh, and there are none that are more economical than the one that we actually offer through consultative services, which is absolutely free. So if you go to our website and go to consultative, uh, there you'll be able to find a written respiratory program where essentially you can use that as boilerplate and fill in your own information and come up with your own program relatively easily. This includes things like medical evaluations, fit testing, and guides on things like training your employees, how to maintain and use your respirators, as well as your record keeping program. So when we look at respirators and a respiratory program, 
the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what are the 10 parts of an effective respirator program? So if we break this down to 10 parts, this will kind of help us uh, figure this out. Now, one thing I do want to mention before we go any further is a lot of folks will say, hey, Andy, um, where can I find a copy of this PowerPoint? And again, I'm going to direct you to our website. If you go to uh, North Carolina Department of Labor, if you Google that, or just go online, just do a search for that, it'll take you to our website. And while you're there, you'll be able to find not only a section uh, for our training and our upcoming training courses that you know many of which are similar to this webinar that you're taking today and once this situation uh, is better with COVID-19 and we're back to normal again then of course we'll be back on the road and teaching in person but until that time comes there's lots of training that you can do there as well as a copy of this PowerPoint program. So if you wanted to teach this, say, to your own employees, you are absolutely welcome to. Or maybe if you just wanted these slides for reference to go along as you're doing this program. So part number one, we need to have somebody in charge. And that somebody that is in charge has to be uh, implemented by a training program administrator. This can be anybody. This can be usually this is whoever is in charge. Uh, they're going to tell their safety person, hey, safety person, we need to have a respiratory program. Or the, re the safety person themselves may come to that conclusion and say, well, we got to have a respiratory program, so I'm the guy, so there we go. What are the qualifications that that person has to have? Well, one, they have to be qualified, and they need to know the hazards in that workplace and how... Uh, these hazards are affecting their employees. Can we use engineering controls? Right, that's a big one because remember we want to try to use engineering controls first and administrative controls before we ever get to PPE. PPE is always, always our very, very, very last resort. Okay, and I really want to emphasize that a lot. There are a lot of different types of respirators that could be used. Uh, if engineering controls won't work, so we need to identify those. You know, what exactly do we need? What will work for our particular situation? Now, the second part is a medical evaluation. Now, any time that you're wearing a respirator, it's going to put a physiological burden on the employee, meaning when they breathe, it's going to cause them uh, a more taxing breath when they inhale. For instance, if you're just breathing air normally, it's very easy. However, if you say take a blanket and put that over your face like a bandana and then try to breathe, you'll notice that it's harder to breathe air in and it's also harder to exhale through that blanket because again those fibers and that weave are impeding your ability to breathe. Now, Essentially, I mean, that's what an respirator does. It filters the air before you breathe it in. So part of the filtration process is the negative air pressure that you create when you inhale and you create a suction on that mask. And we're going to get into this a little bit more when we start talking about um, respirators and uh, filtering media, media that are on filtering face pieces as opposed to something like a surgical mask which just goes over your face and it has so many holes or not holes in the mask itself but gaps where it does not make a seal to your face and those gaps allow air to come in okay different type of mask its use is to prevent large droplets from splashing up on you while you're doing surgery it is not it is not meant as any sort of filtering or filtration piece okay so we want to keep that in mind what type of respirator is going to be worn is an important question to ask when we're doing that medical evaluation as well as what's the job what are we going to be doing what are the workplace conditions is it going to be strenuous there's a big difference between sitting at a lab bench with a respirator on and doing samples if you're say working in a virology or an epidemiology clinic versus being out and, say, cutting concrete with a 
concrete saw and wearing an N95 respirator to do that to protect you from silica. Two very different levels of activity and those two different, very different levels of activity will certainly place different strains on the system. We also need to know the medical status of the employee. Do they have something like COPD? Uh, have they had any sort of medical issues in the past where they are uh, subjected to something like uh, high blood pressure or asthma or any number of ailments that they've had which may limit their lung capacity? They may have just one lung. They may have uh, a, a previous breathing problem, maybe with asbestosis or silicosis. So it's important to remember that any time we have an employee that needs to wear a respirator, we definitely, definitely need to have them tested. So what are some of the physiological effects? Well, I mentioned a few of them as far as the resistance that's caused by breathing, but these things can be pulmonary, cardiovascular, uh, body temperature, they can be uh, psychological, and that's a big one. A lot of people do not like having a respirator or a mask or something on their face, okay? It can be irritating. It can be just something that doesn't feel right. Uh, there are a lot of people that, you know, growing up, uh, they can sleep, and if somebody turns a light on in the room, they can just throw the covers over their head and sleep just fine. There are other people that cannot stand to have covers over their head. That is a psychological component to that, all right? You're not going to suffocate under your covers. It might be a little harder to breathe, and, you know, it's warmer under there, so you're breathing in hot air because it's the, you know, it's warmer under the covers, but you are not by any means going to suffocate. However, psychologically, a lot of people feel like that. They feel like the walls are closing in on them. And I see many a good firefighter that, you know, had to wear an SCBA, and when we got to that point where they had to put the SCBA on their face, they just couldn't do it because it was just psychologically just too much. It felt like something was boxed in and right over the top of their face, which it is. The face mask is right there. Now, for some people like me, I'm so used to it, I don't even realize when it's on, right? I, I don't even think twice about it. It's just second nature to me. Um, I've done hazmat in firefighting for a long time, so for me, I don't even think twice about it. But, you know, for other people, it may have an effect on them. And I have to be, you know, kind of cognizant of that, and I can't just be callous to the fact just because it works for me, it may not work for someone else. Some folks have irritations, some have allergies, so all of these things uh, add up to uh, physical distress that you can have when wearing a respirator. So we need to establish the medical condition of that wearer, and we need uh, that needs to be provided before the medical evaluation needs to be provided before we actually use a respirator. A lot of times we're tempted because we think of a respirator as just oh, you just slap it on your face and breathe. It's not a big deal, right? It's really easy. You know, it's so easy a caveman can do it, right? But the thing is, is that before we do that initial respirator use, and before we do any fit testing or any training or anything else, we have to have this person medically evaluated to make sure that this respirator, now again, I'm talking about a respirator, is not going to affect them, okay? And essentially, the medical examination or the medical questionnaire is, is really just that, it is a questionnaire. You go through, you answer the questions, and then the doctor will look at the answers to those questions, and if they feel like they need to go a little bit above and beyond, then they may recommend having a follow-up medical exam examination. So if you have a positive response to some of these questions, when you have one through eight in section two uh, uh, of the medical questionnaire, then you may need to go back and have some sort of medical test done or some sort of diagnostic procedures done. So section three, selection. How do we choose what respirator we're going to do, going to need in this whole process, right? And which one we're going to use. The biggest thing with this is very first thing that we look at in every situation is we do a job hazard analysis, no matter what it is. It could be something as simple as 
going outside and you know digging a hole to plant a an azalea out in your yard the first thing you're going to do is you're going to size up where you're going to put it you know what's there what tools am I going to need I need a shovel am I going to need an axe are there going to be roots in the way am I going to have to rake before I dig do I want to dig up the grass that's there and maybe put that in another patch that needs grass these are questions that we ask ourselves and things that we look at before we do any job and we also have to extend that so that we're doing that from a safety perspective as well what safety items am I going to need when I do this job Will I need glasses will I need gloves will I need respiratory protection and as you answer these questions it's going to give you an idea of what kind of hazards you're going to have to address now, some of these things can be taken care of with engineering controls when we're talking about respiratory protection the very first thing is ventilation I always encourage people to read the labels on all the products that they're using whether they're at home or they're at work it really doesn't matter read the label because the label will give you some really good direction based on the job that you're doing so what's a good example of that well if you read labels of things like great stuff which is a foam and he's or a foam uh, filler that is used as insulation okay when we spray that out it's a polyurethane and that polyurethane foam can be toxic so if you read on the side it will say use in a well ventilated area well a well ventilated area means outside and a, outside with a breeze is even better inside or down in your basement or up in your attic there is not a whole lot of air movement and air movement is ventilation so that's part of the key we want to make sure that we have good ventilation now for working in say a laboratory in front of a laboratory hood or doing samples that provides us with a lot of ventilation and we may not need to wear a respirator or any sort of secondary respiratory protection if we have a good fume hood at our disposal we may also be working down a confined space in a confined space the air may be stale and stagnant and it may not be quite up to par for breathing air but we can always take a fan and we can ventilate that spot blow in good air pump out bad air and then after an hour or two the air may be just fine in there so that's another good example of adding ventilation now administrative controls are another one I'm going to give you an example let's say I have a chemical that I'm working with and the Pell or permissible exposure limit is 50 parts per million over an eight hour time weighted average now if I'm working with that chemical all day and I do testing on the environment that I'm using the chemical in and as I'm doing that environmental testing after I run the test and get the results I find hey I am working in an environment where my exposure is 60 parts per million over an eight hour time weighted average well now I've exceeded that permissible exposure limit by 10 now I could wear a respirator to bring that exposure down or I could simply just say okay one employee will work there four hours another employee will work there four hours now each employee their exposure is only 30 parts per million or half that amount over an eight hour time weighted average because if your exposure is 60 parts per million for eight hours if you only work four, four hours and you divide by eight now your exposure is 30 parts per million over that time weighted average so that's an example of using administrative controls where we're using a couple of folks to do a job that you know maybe uh, we had one guy doing before and there was a too much exposure there but now we split the job and have uh, you know one person doing it in the morning and another one in the afternoon now we've reduced that exposure level quite a bit now the third thing that we get to is personal protective equipment or PPE 
and we use that when we're unable to eliminate or reduce the hazard sufficiently by engineering or administrative controls. It is our least preferred method, however, sometimes we have to do that. Now, there are hazards that require res uh, respirator use, and we're going to talk a little bit about those. One is an oxygen deficient atmosphere. Oxygen deficient atmosphere, where we are less than 19.5% by volume of oxygen, that is an IDLH atmosphere or immediately dangerous to life or health. Okay? Now, we also will use the same regard if we have an unknown atmosphere. One thing I always try to remind people is that you may see a confined space, and this is really where a lot of these accidents happen, and that confined space, you may stick your nose in there and take a sniff and say, well, I really don't smell anything, right? I don't smell anything funky. I don't smell any chemicals. What about you? Do you smell anything? And your friend will be like, yeah, I, I don't smell anything either. Everything smells fine to me. Is that space fine? Maybe, but maybe not. The only way you know for sure is if you test that space. That's why I tell folks that are going to be involved in any sort of confined space entry, you really need to have some way of testing the air in that space, whether it's a tank, a void, a sewage area, anything that you're going to be going into that's a confined space, you need to test the atmosphere in there. because you may not smell an organic solvent. You may not smell a sulfur smell, which could indicate something like hydrogen sulfide, because a lot of these gases are very heavy and they're down at the bottom. So you may not smell it at the top of the tank, but it may be settled down at the bottom. And the only way you're going to know that is if you actually do testing. So I recommend testing up at the top, a couple of places in the middle, and then down towards the bottom of the tank to see what your actual uh, oxygen conditions are throughout that area. Now, the other thing is you may not even have, there may be no, uh, maybe no dangerous gases, there may be no solvents, but you might have an inert gas in there, like nitrogen. Nitrogen doesn't have an odor, and it smells the same as air, because, you know, 80, 79 to 80% of air actually is nitrogen. So you're not going to be able to detect it with your nose. Again, best thing, use a meter. There are also chemical and biological hazards that we use respir respirators to protect us from. Obviously, with chemical hazards, these can be dust, sprays, fumes, vapors. We're using organic solvents. Uh, anybody that's ever spray painted anything, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Spray paint something on a hot, humid day without a breeze, you will smell that carrier solvent big time in your nostrils, okay, because you're breathing all of that in. Um, we wear masks that protect us, and they use organic vapor cartridges or OV cartridges that protect us from those solvents. Now, with biological hazards, their exposure to organisms such as bacteria, viruses, funguses, and other living organisms, okay? So this is a good point where you know, I do want to mention, because you know, we have gotten a lot of questions about people asking us, okay, so with COVID-19, with the coronavirus, you know, it is a virus. How do I protect myself against that? So I just want to tell you a little bit about what the virus actually is before we go too far into it. So when we talk about uh, coronavirus, all right, coronavirus or coronaviruses are a class. They are a class of viruses, okay? And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of coronaviruses, and they have been around for years. When you get the common cold, that is a coronavirus, okay? Notice with this one, they call it a novel, a novel coronavirus. Novel means new. I'm not talking about a novel you know, like you know, Knights and Rodanthe. I'm talking about novel meaning new, a new, a new virus or a novel coronavirus. So 
a novel coronavirus means a new virus and the name of that is COVID-19. COVID, the COV part, is coronavirus ID-19. It's the 19th of these new ones that we've identified. Now, they're a class of virus, so, you know, we have seen these viruses before in the form of SARS, right, and MERS and things like that, which are respiratory syndromes, okay? That's what the RS part of that is a respiratory syndrome. So it affects your lungs, okay? Now, the virus itself, it's not a living organism, okay? It's a protein molecule. It's a protein molecule that's covered by a protective lipid or protective layer of fat, right? That layer of fat is called a lipid. And when you breathe that molecule in, okay, it's absorbed by cells in your uh, ocular, I mean your eyes or your nasal or your mucus passages, and it changes their genetic code. It, it's a mutation, okay? So whenever uh, we have something like this, it's going to affect your RNA, which ultimately affects your DNA, and it's absorbed and mutated, and it converts those cells into aggressor or multiplier cells. And those multiplier cells are the ones that attack and do the damage to your lungs. Now, since the virus isn't a living organism but a protein molecule, uh, it's not killed, but it does decay on its own. And that disintegration of that protein molecule depends on temperature, humidity, and the type of material where it lies. So once it gets uh, into a place that it really likes, it can survive for quite a bit of time. Now that virus itself is very fragile, okay, and the only thing that's protecting it is that thin outer layer of fat or that lipid. So that's why uh, any soap or detergent is the very best remedy because when you wash your hands, that foam cuts the fat. That's why you have to rub so much, you know, because we talk about doing it for 20 seconds or more to make a lot of foam. The foamier you get, the better, right? But we dissolve that layer of fat, and then that protein molecule just disperses and breaks down on its own, right? So washing your hands, that's why that's the very best and most effective way, if you think you get it on you, is to do that. Now, heat is another one. Heat melts fat away. Uh, that's why it's good to use warm water. That's the time when we wash our hands, you know, we say, oh, good, you know, use hot water. Hot water also makes more foam because, again, our foam that comes from our soap, uh, soap is just a surfactant, right, or a surface active agent. So what it does is it releases the surface tension on our skin, thus little particles of dirt and things raise up and they rinse off uh, while we're using water, and that's why we'll use a surfactant. Now, the other thing is we can use alcohol or any mixture with alcohol over 65%. Now, the alcohol has to be over 65% to dissolve the fat, especially that external lipid layer of the virus, okay? It's really important to remember that it has to be at least 65%. That's why all these people that are like, oh, yes, you drink vodka, you'll be okay. No, no, no. Vodka is not going to cut it, okay, because vodka is less than 65%, all right? So when we look at the volume of alcohol in that, it needs to be 65%. Thus, hand sanitizer does a great job of this. Now, the other thing that we can use to clean things is a mixture of bleach. So one part bleach and the five parts water, um, when you squirt that on that protein, it breaks it down and dissolves it from the inside. I mean, and it breaks it down directly. So a bleach solution is fantastic for cleaning. So anytime you're doing, uh, you know, people will say, oh, you know, I, I go and I do my shopping and I want to, you know, clean things and all that. That bleach and water solution, great thing for cleaning. Uh, a lot of people will use things like Clorox wipes. All right, Clorox wipes, very, very easy. Um, I don't even know if you can still buy Clorox wipes uh, because they're never on the shelf. However, if you're lucky enough to 
uh, have some, then you can certainly, certainly use those. All right. So um, UV light will also break down that protein. So uh, a lot of folks, uh, if you've been watching the news, you'll see that they've been using that to disinfect and reuse masks. Um, but with UV light, you have to be careful handling it because UV light will also break down collagen, which is also a protein, but that's a protein that's in your skin. And when that collagen breaks down, that's how we get wrinkles and skin cancer and things like that. So, you know, any of you out there that, uh, you know, you spent your life, like I grew up at the beach, so I was out in the sun all the time. And so now I'm kind of paying the price for that uh, because, you know, every time I get a, a questionable thing, I'm like, oh, you know, is that is that a, a cancer on my back or something? Because I've had so much UV light on my skin and it's broken down that collagen. Folks that are inside all the time, extremely pale people, uh, usually have very, very healthy skin because of that lack of exposure. So again, it's just kind of uh, a balancing act. But that tells you a little bit about uh, the actual novel coronavirus or COVID-19 and ways that we can attack that, you know, if we want to, uh, you know, get rid of it, uh, wash it, washing our hands and just general good sanitation helps with that. Now, how do we determine what the hazards are? Well, we're going to identify the contaminants um, and then evaluate those the hazards of those contaminants because some things are more dangerous than others. So when we determine the physical properties of the contaminants, uh, the areas of potential oxygen deficiency, that's going to give us a better idea of how to know what kind of respirator we're going to use. Now, again, if you don't know what the oxygen level is, you have to kind of make that assumption that it's an IDLH atmosphere until you prove otherwise. So we select our appropriate respirator based on that hazard, okay? And it's important to remember that the hazard, the workplace, and the user factors all go together. We only want to use a NIOSH certified respirator, okay? So please, everybody pay attention to that, a NIOSH certified respirator, because we're going to talk a little bit more about this as we go on. Now, we also want to provide a sufficient number of respirator models and sizes to correctly fit the user. Because remember, not everybody is the same. I've done lots of fit testing for SCBAs in my time, uh, and you would be so surprised. There are some folks that are big, giant, huge guys that could lift a car by themselves and they will end up needing a small or medium mask where you would swear, oh, that guy's a large, right? And then I've seen people that are tiny and petite and I cannot get a good fit or a good seal on them unless they use like a medium or a large. So again, it's important to have different sizes of respirators to try on and different types of respirators to try on to make sure that you can get a good, a good fit test on that person. Because if the fit is not good, then the respirator is going to be no good. With compressors, if we're using breathing air, we can use it either with a, a line, right, and we're using house air, or we can use a SCBA, which is a self-contained breathing apparatus. And that self-containment means it's in a bottle, right? Just like with a scuba diver, you see them with a tank on their back. That's a self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, or scuba. It's the same thing with a regular SCBA like you would see a firefighter or a hazmat technician use. If you're using house air, then that house air, if it's oil lubricated, it needs to have a CO alarm. And it's important that we monitor that CO because we don't want that to get in our breathing air. At the same time, we also want to make sure that any of the couplings that we have for that are completely different from couplings that we have for the other ones because God forbid the worst thing you would ever want to do is to plug your uh, your breathing air line into say something like nitrogen because you wouldn't know the difference 
except you'd start suffocating with that mask on. And your first thing you're going to do is rip that mask off. And if you rip the mask off, now you're exposed. So make sure, I always tell everybody, if you're using house air, put your mask on before you start. Test it. Make sure you can breathe. Make sure you've got a good fit and everything's fine before you enter that dangerous atmosphere. With interior structural firefighting, remember, at least two employees enter the IDLH atmosphere and they have to remain in visual contact with each other. And we also need to have at least two employees outside. And those two folks that are outside are rescue in case the two that are inside get in trouble. It's really important to remember that, okay? Because we have seen uh, times where you know, we've been out on uh, uh, compliance visits where we have uh, gone to fatalities where a fireman went inside, he was with his partner, he ended up being very aggressive, he lost his partner, his partner was trying to find him, they heard the alarm go off so they knew there was a man down and so they sounded the alarm but the two uh, firefighters that were outside that were supposed to be ready to go, they weren't ready to go. Now they did have their gear with them on site, but they had to get geared up. That takes time. And if a man goes down the fire, then you need to respond very, very, very quickly. Because when someone, when a person goes down in a fire, that's not good. That's bad. That's very bad. And you have got to get in there and get them out because the quicker you can react, the better chance they have of surviving. Now, that rule does not preclude emergency rescue of human beings before the entire team assembles. So if you get there and you need to get in to save lives, then you can do that. But to save property, no, just hold back and wait till everybody gets there. So what exactly does a respirator do? Well, there's two different types of respirators, right? Depending on what you're working in. Uh, there's one that uh, protects workers by supplying breathing air. That's if you're in a, a O2 deficient atmosphere or IDLH condition. But there's also ones that purify the air as you breathe. So air purifying respirators, they're going to remove contaminants using a filter, a cartridge, or a canister, whereas an air supplied respirator is going to uh, provide that air via a bottle or a line hooked to a compressor. So with air purifying res uh, respirators, we see quite a few here. We see a filtering face piece, probably the most famous filtering face piece that we hear so much about is an N95 respirator, which we can see right there. And if you notice that little black dot on the front of it, that is actually an exhalation valve. And I'm going to be showing you examples of N95 respirators at the end of this program. Um, we also have a half mask respirator with combination cartridges. I'll be showing you one of those as well that actually uses an N95 filter as an attachment as opposed to a combination cartridge. Now, you could use that filter with a cartridge or you could use it by itself. We also have full face piece respirators which we can outfit the same way. And in this case, this one has an organic vapor cartridge. The last one on this slide is a powered air purifying respirator, or a PAPR. And what that means is it actually has a fan that draws air through a HEPA filter, right, or high efficiency purifying air filter. And that HEPA filter will clean the air as it's coming in. And then you have positive air in your mask. And it can be a hood. It can be a half mask, it can be a full mask. There's a lot of different combinations. So a filtering face piece. This is what we call, uh, we refer to a lot of times, N95 respirator is a filtering face piece. Uh, negative pressure, particulate respirator, with the entire, the majority of the face piece composed of a filtering medium. So when you breathe in, it's going to capture particles that are in the air, like dust, aerosol, mist, fumes, uh, it will catch things like biologics, so you know, protect you against things like uh, bacteria, germs, viruses, and things like that. It does not protect against gases and vapors, okay? It does not protect against gases and vapors. It simply filters the air. 
but gas and vapor molecules are too small and they will get through that. Now, notice it says a filter and that filter will have an N, an R, a P, and a number that represents the efficiency. So N means it's not resistant to oil, not resistant to oil. An R means it is somewhat resistant to oil. And a P means it's strongly resistant to oil or oil proof. That's why it's a P. The numbers or the efficiency numbers are just that. A 95 filters at least 95% of airborne particles. A 99 filters 99% of airborne particles. And a 99.9 .9 filters out essentially 100% of airborne particles. Each one of these, as you get progressively thicker and tighter in your weave of the fabric that makes this mass, it provides more and more and more filtration. And that's why we have these efficiencies that go from 99 or 95 to 99 to 100. Now we also have, whoops, a full and half mask. Now, full and half mask respirators, these contain, uh, are, they're used for atmospheres that contain particulates and uh, gases and vapors, both. So they have both filters that can address both situations. Uh, a gas vapor cartridge or canister, and that also part uh, will filter out a certain amount of particulates. You can also add an additional pre-filter to that, which will filter out even more particulates. Now, the thing is, is that if you're using one of these for a long time, uh, it becomes more difficult to breathe through because of the extra effort required to draw through all of that purifying medium, because you're not just uh, breathing now through a thin fabric mask. Now you're actually breathing through the fabric and the cartridge, and you're breathing more stuff out. And the more stuff that gets depend gets deposited on that actual filter media, the more difficult it is to breathe. And that's why we recommend change cartridges frequently. Now those cartridges will have written on the outside exactly how long they're good for. However, you have to be careful because those are very loose guidelines and a lot of it depends on a lot of different factors. So it can be estimated in a lot of different ways. A lot of those factors are things like heat, humidity, how hard the person's breathing. Uh, so if you're in really good shape and you don't take very many breaths per minute, then, you know, you will be easier on a cartridge than someone that is, say, you know, out of shape and is breathing really heavy, all right? Now you also have the Powered Air Purifying Respirator, PAPR. Now this is, uh, this respirator uses a blower to force ambient air through an air purifying element, a lot of cases it's just a HEPA filter, and it goes to the inlet covering. And that can be a full or half face piece, it can be a helmet, it can be a hood. There's a lot of different combinations with this. However, the use is restricted to the battery life and the fan. So you want to make sure that you know the batteries that you're using are pretty fresh because it may start up and then you get in the middle of whatever you're doing and then you know the fan dies and when it dies now you don't have uh, air blowing into that mask. Notice it says it cannot be used in an oxygen deficient or IDLH atmosphere. That's very important. Okay, and it's very important to understand that. So I'm going to um, want to mention this uh, right here now, because we get a lot of questions about this. If you're wearing an SCBA, okay, that face piece, which we're going to see, it needs to have a good seal around your face. You cannot use a powered air purifying respirator in lieu of an SCBA in an IDLH atmosphere. Okay, you can't do it. It is not designed for that. If you're trying to use it in an oxygen deficient or IDLH atmosphere, you will either suffocate or, you know, you know, go down. You know, it is not designed for that purpose. I have a lot of people that, for whatever reason, 
they feel like they can't shave their beard, um, but if you're going to be a professional firefighter, hazmat technician, or anybody else that wears a oxygen mask, okay, an SCBA, and you have to have a seal, then you've got to shave that beard. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I get a good enough seal even with my beard. I'm going to tell you the difference. The CDC did a study where difference. The CDC did a study where they looked at clean-shaven people versus people with beards with an SCBA. The seal for a person that was clean-shaven and properly fitted, the mask was 99.97% efficient. 99.97% efficient. For a person with a beard, it was 97% efficient. Now, I know you're saying, well, 97% is pretty good. I mean, 97% is nothing to sneeze at. If you're taking an algebra test, absolutely. 97% is great. If you're flying airplanes, and I was to tell you, hey, 97% uh, airplanes reach their destination, but 3% crash. You probably would never fly on a plane ever again. It is a difference of 100. 0.03 versus 3%. That's huge. So remember, okay, please remember, you need to shave your beard if you're going to wear an SCBA. Now, that cartridge and canister service life, a lot of people ask me about this, and they're like, well, how long exactly do these last? There is no real way to give you an exact measurement. Okay, these last based on a lot of different things. The exertion level, like I was mentioning, you know, are you in good shape? Are you not in good shape? That will have a big, big role in this because of how hard you're breathing. Cartridge variability, you know, uh, even cartridges made by the same manufacturer aren't maybe absolutely identical, right? There might be some variability in the medium that is packed inside that cartridge. Temperature plays a big role. Humidity plays a big role. If you're on a very humid day, uh, the, most of these pil uh, filters that are inside these uh, filtering uh, uh, canisters are some sort of treated paper filter which will absorb whatever it is, whether it's ammonia or organic vapor and so on. But they're also susceptible to getting wet. And if there's a, a, a lot of moisture in the air, the more you breathe that, the more it will actually end up settling on that cartridge and saturating that cartridge, and it's not going to last nearly as long. The last thing is multiple contaminants. If you're using one of these, uh, you know, like a lot of people will say, well, I don't know if it's going to be organic vapor or if it's going to be ammonia or what it's going to be. So I'm just going to get a multi-use cartridge. If you get a multi-use cartridge, that's great, but it may not last nearly as long as if you were to get one that's specific to the job that you're doing. So these canisters need to be NIOSH approved. They're going to be labeled and color-coded so you don't get them mixed up. And please, whatever you do, don't remove the label. Now, when we talk about using these things, they have an assigned protection factor. And that assigned protection factor is essentially how much protection does this type of respirator give you. Now, these all change, and they vary drastically. Okay, So there's a big difference between a filtering face piece and a half mask respirator. So you can see here we have a filtering face piece. This is a filtering face piece. And this is a half mass respirator. Of all the ones, this is going to have the highest assigned protection factor. So when we look at this table, that's going to give us a better idea of what we need. Now, if you, you know, if we're looking at this, and let's just look at uh, 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 SAR, right? And with that, we see there is demand, continuous flow, pressure demand air purifying, PAPR, and an SCBA. 
let's use air purifying because that's usually the most typical one that people are using because that's the best example. A quarter mask, okay, has a APF of 5. But something like a half mask is going to go up to 10. So now that's considerably more. Then when we go to a full face piece, it goes up as high as a 50. So you can see between a quarter mask and full face piece, that is a whole 10 times greater. All right. And then when we go to something like a, a, a PAPR or an SCBA or an SAR, we can see a huge, huge difference between the half mask, the full face, and then something that has a helmet, a hood, or full face piece. Okay, so big differences there. The maximum use concentration, this is the maximum atmospheric concentration uh, of a hazardous substance from which an employee can be expected to be protected when wearing that respirator. Okay, so it's determined by the assigned protection factor of the respirator or the class of respirator and the exposure limit of the hazardous substance or the PEL. So when we look at calculating an MCU, this is how we do it. We look at the APF or the assigned protection factor times the PEL. That gives us a maximum use con uh, concentration. We can also use that for short-term exposure limits or STELs or ceiling limits, right, the CL. So the fourth part, and I promise you that was the biggest part of the whole thing because you're probably looking at your clock saying, oh my God, we've been at this 50 minutes uh, and we're only through three parts and there's 10. Yes, but stick with it. Uh, we, are, we are getting there. So part four, when it comes to training, training is required. We need to do that annually and we need to do that before that employee wears the respirator. We also need to make sure that if we have any changes in the workplace uh, that render any of the previous training obsolete, we need to make sure that we let our employees know so that they know about these changes and they can adjust to them. Also, occasionally, um, you know, situations arise which retraining may uh, appear necessary. Maybe everybody's doing the same thing wrong or maybe you have a lot of the same questions about how do I do this or you know, maybe how do I clean this respirator? How do I maintain it? You may need to have a refresher course. Sometimes, okay, sometimes you'll see an employee doing something completely wrong. If you see that, stop them and say, hey, you know, we need to talk and go through and train them on that section on the thing that they're doing wrong. But remember, uh, regardless, you need to do this training annually, okay, annually. So, what do we include in the training? Well, you know, you see quite a few things here, but the biggest thing is, in addition to all these, is uh, making sure the person knows how to use the respirator correctly and they know how to keep it clean and sanitary. Those are usually the two biggest things. If you're going to have problems with your respiratory program, the problems that you're going to have are people not wearing it correctly and also people not wearing it and keeping it clean. If it gets dirty, it's not going to work nearly as well as it would work if it were clean. Now, what do I mean by wearing it correctly? Well, this whole thing with coronavirus has been a great example of that. So, uh, you know, when I look out the window and I see a lot of public works folks that are out there collecting the trash, or collecting yard waste and things like that, they've all been given a surgical mask to put on. Now, a surgical mask is not going to provide a seal. It's not NIOSH approved. It's FDA approved. And what it does is it does provide you with a certain amount of protection from large uh, particulates. And those large particulates, especially large droplets, that's why they call it a surgical mask, is it keeps that from splashing in your face. You cut into an artery. Uh, and the artery is under pressure and it blows right into your face and you get blood all over your face. You don't want to get that in your mouth. The surgical mask will prevent that from happening. However, it does have gaps and it does allow air in. Now that being said, you need to wear it over your nose and over your mouth. And I will see a ton of these guys will be wearing them over their mouth but not over their nose. Okay, so you know you want to wear it over your nose and your mouth. Anything where air you breathe in or you breathe out 
needs to be covered with that surgical mask. And again, if we're only you know covering our mouths with it, it doesn't do the job that it's designed to do. And that is so important to remind people because if you don't have the respiratory or the, the respirator fitted and you don't have the respiratory doing what it needs to do, then it is absolutely worthless and there's no point even wearing it. Okay, so part five is fit testing. How do we do our fit testing? Well, we want to make sure or we do our fit testing, however you do it, that you do it before the initial use and then you do it annually thereafter. Because remember, people can change. So you'd be surprised uh, at the changes in facial features, especially when you're talking about something like a half mask respirator or an SCBA mask, something like that. You have people can gain weight, people can lose weight, uh, people can get a tooth knocked out, they may get dentures. All of these things will change their facial features just slightly enough that it will make a big difference in how their mask fits. Now there are a couple of different types of testing. There's qualitative fit tests, which that qualitative fit test is nothing more than a pass-fail test to assess the adequacy of that respirator fit. Okay, A lot of times we'll use something like uh, amyl acetate or banana oil. We'll say, hey, what do you smell? If they say, oh, I smell bananas, then you know you don't have a good fit. If they say, I don't smell anything, then you know you got a good fit. Now, you need to make sure that the person that you're testing, ask them, you know, do you have a sense of taste? Do you have a sense of smell? Because if they don't have a sense of smell or taste, this isn't going to work for them. Now, we use this for respirators with a fit factor of 100 or less. Okay, and That's important, 100 or less. If we need better than that, then we're going to have to move to a quantitative fit test. And a quantitative fit test is used for respirators that require a fit factor of 500 or greater. And with this, we're actually going to do a test on the respirator. It takes a lot more time. It's more laborious. But it will give you a numerical measurement of the amount of leakage into the respirator. So part six is maintenance and care. When we look at uh, the maintenance of our respirator, we need to make sure we effectively know how to clean it and how to disinfect it. So a respirator has to be clean and sanitary. If it's gross and it's full of dust and dirt and grime and slime, these guys aren't going to put it on their face. And even if they do put it on their face, it's not going to operate correctly because it use th uses things like very thin butterfly valves and all that. And they can get sticky with residue from you know breathing and from the particulates that you're breathing in, especially if it's something that's water soluble. It'll form a film and that film can make these valves stick. So the respirator is not going to perform the way it's designed. So make sure that your folks are cleaning their respirators on a regular basis. Again, when we're talking about problems that you're going to have with a respirator program, one is cleanliness and sanitariness and, and how sanitary it is. Two is fit, right, and making sure that they're wearing things correctly because if they're not wearing it correctly, they're not going to have a good fit. Cleaning and disinfecting, again, uh, they need to do it at regular intervals. So if you have one respirator and it's shared by multiple employees, it needs to be cleaned and sanitized prior to each use by a different employee. This is part of the problem that we're having in hospitals now. We were not prepared for a global pandemic and we were not prepared for the amount of PPE that we needed. And because of that, we're falling very short when it comes to things like respirators and masks. So with masks, one of the things that they've come up with is a way of disinfecting N95 respirators by using things like a hydrogen peroxide mist or using UV light. But again, even if you've worn that mask all day, when you take it off before the pandemic, they were disposable. You would use a fresh, clean mask every time you did anything with a patient. Today, nurses are being told to wear that the entire shift, and then after the shift is over, they throw it into a bag, and you have uh, a technician that takes that bag, they hang all those respirators in an airtight room, flood it with hydrogen peroxide mist, 
which will kill all the bacteria, germs, and viruses on there. And then, you know, after they've been subjected to that, or I think it's like four or five hours, then they degas the room, uh, take all the respirators, and they'll redistribute them for the next shift. But they have to be clean. They cannot be shared by different employees without being clean. And it's very important to maintain these things in a clean and sanitary condition. Now, you know as well as I do, um, you know, I'm sure you have friends, loved ones, neighbors, whatever, that you talk with regularly, and, you know, some of them have better oral hygiene than others. That plays a big factor. That's why it's really important if you have uh, folks that are wearing respirators, you know, it's better if they have their own respirator rather than having to share one. Now, storage is important. Uh, we want to protect it from dust, sunlight, heat, cold, moisture. Uh, and it says store in a sealed container or bag. I'm going to show you the bag that I use for my SCBA at the end of this. But remember, uh, when you store it in a sealed container or bag, you want to make sure it is absolutely positively bone dry. Because if you seal it up and it's still wet, you're going to end up getting mold and mildew on your mask. And then when you think you're putting on a nice clean mask to get started, uh, it's actually going to smell really funky and very musty because of all of that. And it can make you sick if you wear it like that. So make sure when you clean it, it is thoroughly dried. And when you put it in a bag, in fact, the bag that comes along with it for storage is actually a drawstring bag. And you pull that drawstring too, but it does leave a little bit of a gap, a little bit of an opening uh, so that air can get in so it can breathe. When you're doing your inspection of your respirator, you want to make sure that you check for holes, any loss of elasticity or tears in the head straps, any cracked or, or uh, scratched face pieces, detergent residue because that will cause valves to stick, any dirt in the valves, and just general cleanliness of it when you do it. Anytime you've got respirators that are uh, maintained for emergency use, you want to make sure that you check them every month. Monthly inspections and make sure they're in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. It's very, very important that you do that. Uh, we're learning that the hard way. Uh, again, as this uh, goes back to our COVID-19 response, one of the things they've learned on the federal level is that with uh, ventilators that they thought they had in stock that were fine and good and ready to go, they actually had not been doing maintenance on these. They skipped the maintenance on it last year as a money-saving effort, and by skipping the maintenance on them and not cranking them up and making sure that they were working, now uh, they may be in the stockpile that they're not ready to be shipped. So it's really important. Make sure you check your manufacturer's recommendation and you're testing these things at the proper intervals, especially if it's a respirator, an SCBA, something that your life is going to depend on. It's important to make sure that it works. Now. If you do have a deficiency in your SCBA or your respirator, make sure that those repairs are made only by trained personnel and make sure that you're using NIOSH approved parts, right? Don't use just second or uh, secondary or tertiary parts uh, where you really don't know where they're from. They need to be NIOSH approved. Part seven is our use. Always put the respirator on a clean air environment before you go in to the dirty air and make sure that you have a proper seal by doing a negative pressure check as well as a positive pressure check. So you can see in the top picture uh, he has his hands over the uh, cartridges and he tries to breathe in and when he does that the, the actual respirator will collapse and then when he puts his hand over the exhalation valve and tries to breathe out the uh, mask will actually puff up. And I'll show you examples of that. Uh, as we get towards the end here. Use, make sure that you're using it and that correctly and that you've got a tight seal around your nose and your mouth. Okay, that's very important. Don't let facial hair get between your skin and the respirator. Okay, if you got a big old handlebar mustache uh, or a big pencil thin mustache with the handlebars, make sure you take those wraps and you shove them inside the mask. Okay, glasses can't be worn with a full respirator, okay? So I've had a lot of people have said, you know, 
well, hey, we wear a full respirator. Can I wear my glasses? The answer is no, because the stems of your glasses that hook behind your ears interfere with the seal around your face. Now, they do make spectacle kits, and that spectacle kit is essentially a snap-in pair of glasses that fits right where they need to fit, and you get your prescription put in there, and you're good to go. Now, remember, when you leave, uh, when you're using the mask, you need to leave that contaminated atmosphere if any of these things happen. Maybe if your eyes or throat become irritated, that means you might have some sort of leak in your mask where some bad air is getting in. If you smell or taste something out of the ordinary, I tell people a lot of times uh, they will say, hey, I'm using organic vapor cartridges, and after four or five hours, uh, I'm using acetone, and after four or five hours, I can taste acetone in my mouth. Should I change my cartridges? Answer, absolutely. You should have changed them before that. If it happens once, make sure you change the, car, the cartridges and you know, make sure you change them on a regular basis so that that never happens again. It's very important. Make sure you pay close attention when you're wearing that. If something seems funky and off, use the area, uh, leave the area, and make sure that you change cartridges, get some fresh air, look at the mask, make sure you don't have a problem. So our program evaluation. We always want to conduct workplace evaluations because a lot of times our chemicals that we're using change, and when they do change, we may not even need a respiratory program anymore. So it's no, there's no point in maintaining a respirator program if you don't need a respiratory program because that just wastes time and resources. Now, if you need it, it's important to have it, and you can make it very easygoing and very easy to use. However, if you don't need it, there's no point in having it because it's just one more thing to keep up with. Always make sure you talk to your employees about the fit of their respirator, proper use, proper maintenance, and make sure that they have the proper fitting one and they've made the proper selection. Record keeping. Make sure you have a written program. Written programs easy to do. Again, go to consultative services. If you go to our website uh, at uh, North Carolina Department of Labor, you will find uh, plenty of boilerplate there that you can make your own written program. Also, do medical evaluations. It's very important. You'll find those. You can print those out and take them to your doctor. Keep your fit test records and keep uh, a good record. I encourage people just to keep these, uh, you know, keep a notebook and then scan everything in the notebook for, say, you know, like when the year ends, uh, and 2021 starts, I might take my entire notebook and just scan the entire thing, and now I've got every page of my notebook, all my records, everything is in the computer. I save it as a PDF file. That way, if there's ever any question, I can open it up and show the compliance officer, hey, this is what happened. These are the inspections we did. Uh, this is the person's, you know, this person's worked here for three years, and they've always maintained their respirator and had good luck with it. Here's the pictures. Here's the medical evaluations, here's the fit tests, everything. Keep it all together. Keep it all together and make sure that you keep those medical records. So when we're doing that program, that program is going to, essentially it's a guide. It's a guide to help us through this and to make sure we're making the right decisions. You know, are we selecting the right respirator? Have we done our medical evaluations? Have we done proper fit testing? All of these things are really important. In addition, it's got to be worksite specific, meaning if at, uh, let's say you have multiple plants uh, all over the nation and at your plant in Atlanta, you're using one set of chemicals, but your plant, say in Chicago, you're using a different set. You can't go from one or the other. It has to be worksite specific. So make sure when you're doing your evaluation, you're doing your JHA, that you're paying attention to that because uh, you may have ammonia cartridges in one place and not use any organic uh, vapor cartridges and the other one you may use just organic vapor cartridges and no ammonia. So you got to make sure your employees are ready for whatever they're going to see. Now, the next thing that's important to remember is voluntary use. Okay, voluntary use. Voluntary use is really, really, really important to remember because 
a lot of folks will want to use a respirator, right? But maybe they don't need one. So what we have to do is determine that that voluntary use is appropriate, right? Um, and make sure that whatever uh, respirator the person selects is not going to create a greater hazard. So if you've got a person that's not in the best medical shape, you know, they're not, they're not physically fit, they're not in the best shape, period, and they want to use some sort of, you know, big heavy-duty respirator, that's probably not a great idea. You know, if they say, well, you know, the dust is real bad when I sweep out the uh, garage or the, you know, warehouse, um, I want to wear a respirator, it may not be the best call because, again, you don't want to put a strain on their system. So all respirators except, except for filtering face pieces, the employer has to establish and implement a written program to address medical evaluations and training on maintenance, storage, and care. That's for respirators except, except filtering face pieces. Now with the appendices, the appendices are very, very, very important to pay attention to because they contain a lot of great, a lot of great information. Fit testing procedures. Those are mandatory. We need to know what those are. Same thing with user uh, seal check procedures. Before you use that mask, you've got to check your seals. Respirator cleaning, medical evaluation, those things are all mandatory and information for employees when re using respirators when they're not required on the standard, that's also required. So we've covered a lot of ground and we're going to switch over now to our video portion so you can see uh, a demonstration of how we use uh, some of these masks. Now, the first thing I want to tell you is that we have a lot of different masks and with N95 respirators, which is the one everybody has questions about, we have to remember not all N95 respirators are the same. Here's our example. Here's two. This one in my right hand, this one in my left. If you read them right here and here, they both say North N95 respirators. But there's a difference. This one has a check valve. That's a one-way check valve, and you can see it right here. And there's a butterfly valve that is inside of that. And that butterfly valve, when I breathe and I exhale, the air goes out of the mask, okay? And when I inhale, the seal is shut, and I'm just breathing through the filtered face piece here. But when I exhale, the filter opens, and the exhalation comes out. Now, why would I have that in a mask like this? It's because it keeps it free of a lot of moisture. Okay, when we breathe and we exhale, we have a lot of moisture, uh, you know, from our lungs. So, you know, if you hold your hand up in front of your face, you'll feel that it'll get wet uh, and humid. Okay, so it's very important to make sure with this type. You know, you have this exhalation valve. This type is every bit as effective, okay? It just doesn't have the exhalation valve, so the inside is going to get a little more humid, a little more moist, a little more, you know, uh, soggy over time, all right? Now, the one thing that's important to remember, uh, this is an N95 respirator, okay? An N95 respirator. And this is what we call a filtering face piece because it fits on our face. And if you notice, all the way around here, this seals, okay, forms a seal on our face. Now, this is different from a surgical mask. Now, you've seen a surgical mask is essentially just a plain square mask that goes over your mouth and your nose, and you pull it tight by tying little straps behind your head. Now, remember, the difference between these is that an N95 respirator, this has to be NIOSH approved, and you'll see it says it right, right here. It says NIOSH approved. A surgical mask is approved by the FDA. A surgical mask keeps out large droplets. This is designed for small droplets. It will filter out as a 95, 95% of our particulates. 
this is an N, so it is not oil resistant. However, it is moisture resistant, so when you're breathing, anything that's a, a wet particle will get caught on the outside. Whereas with a surgical mask, it is just a particle will get caught on the outside. Whereas with a surgical mask, it is just designed for large particles that come up. That's the reason why in a medical setting, when we're dealing with COVID patients, we're going to be wearing this, okay? We're going to wear this. If we're dealing with other patients that maybe have a cold or, you know, uh, you know, they've got a cut that needs to be stitched up or some other ailment, using a surgical mask is plenty, right? If you're a dentist, using a surgical mask is fine unless you're doing dental work on somebody that's a COVID patient, in which case you'll want to wear this. Really, you probably want to just give them to come back on another day if they can do it. So how do we use one of these? Well, we take the mask and we hold it like this and we're going to slide our hand underneath. So if you notice, the straps are underneath my hand and the mask is here on my hand. You want to avoid touching the inside of the mask, okay? Remember, our hands are the number one carrier of this virus because we touch things. We touch everything. That's why the Surgeon General and Dr. Fauci and everybody else has said, don't touch your face, okay, because you don't want to touch your face. You touch your face, anything that's on your fingers gets on your face. It gets in your nose, it gets in your mouth, it gets in your eyes. Don't touch your face, okay? So how do I not touch my face when putting this on? Well, easy. I hold it from the outside and I put it over my face. Now, you see the mask is right here. I'm going to put it on my face. And in this case, I'm going to take my glasses off so I can make sure I get a good fit. Notice I have two straps. The first strap is the bottom strap. I'm going to pull that down behind my neck and underneath my ears. Ladies, if you have a long ponytail or gentlemen, you know, because there's guys out there too that wear a ponytail. If you got a pony, lift that pony up, put the strap behind it so it's resting on the nape of your neck. It should be on skin. The second strap, pull it behind your head and above your ears, just like that, and make sure it's not folded over and that you have a good seal. Now, we're not done yet because we have to seal the nose piece. So we take this nose piece and we just kind of squeeze it so that we get a good seal right along the bridge of our nose. Now, I can test that seal, okay, by... I can put my hand over the top of this exhalation valve and breathe. And if I get resistance and it puffs the mask out, then I know I've got a good seal. Okay? I can put my hands over it like this and try to breathe in. And if it caves in, then I know I've got a good seal. Okay? So this is a good seal. It's a good fit. You know, it works fine for me. For you, you might need to do something a little different. Some people have asked, you know, do I put the top strap on first, the bottom strap on? It doesn't matter. I've seen official instructions from the CDC, the WHO, the, the manufacturer, everybody and their brother. They have different methods. The main thing is, is make sure when you put the straps on that they fit. And then when you put this bottom one on, that it is against your bare skin, not on a ponytail. Because again, with the, if you have it sitting on a ponytail or something like that, that fit's going to change as you bobble your head up and down and move it because your pony's going to pull and it's going to make this move around. All right? So take the mask off, pull the first strap, pull the second strap, and pull it off of your face. And now you're good to go. Next respirator I want to show you is a half mask respirator. A half mask respirator works essentially the same way, except now instead of the whole face piece being filtering, now you have two inlet valves and one exit valve. That's a large butterfly valve. When I breathe out, this opens up and the air gets out. Now again, these are designed to be taken apart and to be cleaned. That snaps on just like that. 
I have a cartridge. You can see one right here. And this is what it looks like disassembled. You have the base. You have the filtering media, which is right here. And you can see it says uh, NIOSH N95 North at the top. So it's a North uh, respirator. So it's designed for this respirator. If it was a different one, like say 3M or MSA or someone else, then I would want to use the filter medium that comes with that because it's designed for that system. In this case, this is a North, so I'm going to use a North filtering piece. And then I also have the cap, which goes over. So how do I set this up? I take the filter, I drop it in the cap like that, and then I take this portion and seal it up just like that. You heard it snap. So now I'll take this and I will screw it right on to this post there we go and now I can take this face piece I'm again I don't want to touch anything on the inside I want to keep that clean so I'm going to take this put it over my face and now I'll put this head strap behind here where it will settle and I will take the next strap and pull it around the bottom just like this. Now I've got a good snug fit. You can hear when I'm breathing. I'm going to test this fit to make sure it's okay. I'm going to put my hands over these cartridges. Did you see how the mask caved in? Watch. Just like that. When I exhale, I'm going to put my hand over this exhalation valve. Watch how the mask puffs out. And I can hear the air coming out the top here because this is burnt. So in, out. We have a good seal. The one last mask that I want to show you, and this is specific to our folks that work in fire service is you're going to be using your SCBA. Now with a lot of SCBAs that we have out there, they use a number of different uh, face masks. If you use something like Scott, and I think you know, many of the others use that too, but Scott actually has a filtering face piece that you can put when you take your actual supplied air off you can put this on so it requires having only one mask and in this case this is an AV3000. Now I'm going to take my headset off here so I can do this and I think you can hear me probably just fine. Now with this I'm going to put my Nomex hood on first and now the next thing is I'll have my filtering face piece. Now this face piece, which is an AV3000 for my SCBA, you can see it seals along the edges and also there's a cone here for the face where it goes over my nose and my mouth. So notice all the way around, okay, I am clean shaven. Now I could have like a little mustache on the inside, right, right along in here, as long as it did not interfere with the actual face piece. So a little mustache is okay. If you want to have the little sole pad, that's good too. But again, it can't interfere with the seal. So I'll put this on. So now I have a good seal. I'm going to tighten my straps. And again, I can, in this case, I can make sure I got a good seal. Now I'm ready to get in. And so now the last piece is I can take my helmet and put that on, and I am good to go. So remember, right, when you have 
any sort of breathing apparatus, it's so important to make sure that you have a good seal. All right. And then always use your strap. All right, great. So to summarize, as we went through and looked at different masks today, we looked at why it's important to have a written respiratory protection program. How do we select the different types of respirators that are out there? What are you know? How do we use uh, this written respiratory program and our JHA? How do we use that to define the criteria by which we're going to select our respirator? What kind of medical evaluations and fit testing do we need to do? How do we train our folks on this? And it's important to train them on the use, the maintenance, and care of the respirator. And then how do we evaluate our program and make sure that this program is the right program for us and that we even need a program? Because remember, chemicals change. And if you're no longer using the chemicals that you need for the program, you may not need the program. The final thing we looked at was record keeping. How do we keep track of all of these things as we go through? So I want to thank everybody for attending. Thank you so much for, uh, for uh, watching this video. We have a number of different videos online you can look at. I'd also encourage you to go to our website uh, at North Carolina Department of Labor and look up our training schedule. We have all kinds of different training. Uh, we offer a variety of different webinars as well as speakers bureaus uh, at your facility. Or we can even set up a webinar speakers bureau uh, with your facility. So thanks again for everyone coming out, well, or just tuning in, and I will look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.